there are about 200,000 advanced manufacturing jobs in New England, and Connecticut is home to about one-third of those. A training program at Asnuntuck Community College has helped educate about 10,000 people in the industry in recent years. But you might be asking yourself, isn't the manufacturing industry a dying one? Frank Galuni, Director Emeritus of their Advanced Manufacturing Technology Program, and two as Nuntuck students say no. And I sat down with him to find out why. The simple description would be static versus fluid. Uh, typically in manufacturing, what you're doing today, you might be doing a year or two or three from now. In advanced manufacturing, you can expect that within the next year or two, your job will have changed, your career will have changed, maybe once, twice, or even more, uh, simply because if you're going to compete in this world today with, with not only what's happening in this country, but worldwide, uh, you have to continue to make your product even more effective, less expensive, and that requires higher technology. So what we try and do at Isnanta Community College is prepare people for the advanced manufacturing technology field, recognizing that if they don't have a real foundation, a secure foundation for what's going to happen over the next five or eight or ten years, then we really, we really have cheated those individuals because we've given them an opportunity for a job but not a career. Caitlin, how did you become interested in this field? So I actually got involved with it in high school. Um, I was in middle school and we used to take shop classes as a given class that everyone took. Um, and then I was so into it, I really liked it, I was doing well. Um, so I wanted to get into it in high school, but because you're given electives by seniority, I didn't actually get to take a class until I was a junior. Um, and I would loved it so much. In my senior year, I took, I think, four technical classes. My high school shop teacher told me, you should tour as Nuntuck. I think you'd be really good at this. I think this is something you could do long term. So that's what I ended up doing was touring. And I got involved with it, and I just loved it. So, Sean, you were involved in a very niche sector of this industry and then actually had to go back to school, right? So what are you doing now? Right now I'm in the uh, advanced, uh, advanced machining um, program at, as Nuntuck. Mm -hmm. And we're just pretty much rounding all my skills out so I can work anywhere. And does that really speak to that piece, Frank, that you were talking about where it's training people not only for one or two years but a broader, a broader amount of time? Absolutely, because what happened to Sean has happened to so many thousands of people in our greater community over the last 15 or 20 or 30 years that we wanted to make certain that this time around we provided them with the capability to recognize that it wasn't the company for which they were working that was critical, it was the skill sets they brought with them so that even if the company dissolved somehow, they could go to X, Y, and Z other companies with those skill sets and, 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 and be able to continue their career. But with technology changing so quickly, how do you make sure that your skills are where you need them to be? Our base, what we learn, it's so much of everything that when things advance, we're still able to step up and you know learn the next new thing quicker than everybody else because we've already, you know, Saw it. The critical piece is foundation, foundation, foundation. It's just like a college education. It gives you the beginnings of an ability to make the changes as required because you have that foundation. And that's what we really attempt to do with the math, the blueprint reading, the GD&T, the metrology, uh, the CNC machining, the quality assurance, the solid work. So we're really concerned that we understand where industry is going and we need to be prepared to make certain our students, once they leave us, have that ability to grow with the industry. Despite the high-tech nature of what we've been discussing here, I still think that there's sort of this misconception around, you're all nodding, you know where yep. I'm going, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> around manufacturing, that it's, uh, it's layoff prone and dead end. Why do you think that persists? I think because for so long that was kind of the case, Absolutely. you know, you could fly under the radar for a long time or you could get put out of work in a couple years and you're shifting around. But, you know, these days the jobs that are being done, you know, there are companies around here that I know that have custom machines that can't do anything without being done right here. You know, they can't go overseas. They can't go other places. We have specialized equipment and specialized processes that other countries don't have. And, you know, to be able to make aerospace parts for our, you know, our country, they're all made here. You know, A lot of the work that we do is military-based. Everyone thinks that you're going to get into a shop and nothing changes and you know eventually it's going to get shipped overseas, but in reality, everything is changing constantly and there's new work coming all the time. Sean, for you, what's the biggest surprise that you found in this line of work or in training for this line of work? Um, how much similar it was to the job that I was doing before and just how much future-proofing you are your career, where 
you know, even if something were to happen, I get laid off, I can apply somewhere else. That wouldn't be a problem, you know. Mm -hmm. you, you are in demand. Mm. Frank, for you, you've worked in this industry and you've helped thousands of people in this area find jobs and train for jobs in advanced manufacturing. If someone's listening to this and they think, ah, I don't know if I'm a good fit, you know, what would you say? What are the skill sets they need? I think the last part of what I would say to that person is that you have to have good uh, hand skills. You have to have the physical skills. Those are tertiary now. It's really more about a passion for seeing things developed, evolving, for changing constantly. So you're in an industry in which what you're doing today, you're certainly not going to do in three or five years or 10 years. You're going to continue to evolve. Uh, so I think it's for people who really have a passion for change, who have a passion to see things evolve and develop. From what I've read, there are quite a few baby boomers who still hold jobs in this sector, but some of them are retiring or many of them are retiring. How do those two things come together? Do we have enough young people in the pipeline to fill those jobs? We have a terribly, terribly serious, serious problem. We expect, in, in the state of Connecticut alone, we expect in the next 10 years to have 50,000 new employment opportunities in advanced manufacturing. Uh, there is no way at this juncture uh, that we have the ability to fill those jobs. And what I am doing personally uh, is uh, in getting involved in the inner cities of Hartford and Bridgeport, New Haven, and places like that. I'm trying to develop a program that starts with second graders, in which we provide three hours a week, 108 hours a year, over nine years through 10th grade, hoping that as a result of that interface with the parents and the educators along with it, because they're really the ones you have to evolve a relationship with, because it is they who for years and years felt that manufacturing was that other thing, and we really don't want our children to go into those careers, so we need to change those attitudes. But at the same time, we really need to go where kids are still being born, and that is in our inner cities, and get them involved in advanced manufacturing so that by the time they get to high school, they would like to pursue a career in manufacturing. Caitlin, did you feel like you were in the minority when you were in school? When I was looking at um, just the top four people who are leading companies in Connecticut, they're all men, um, they're all high earners. Were you in the minority when you were in school as a woman? Yeah, so I was the only girl in my group for the first semester, um, which honestly was the best thing for me because um, it made me go out of my comfort zone a lot. I grew up in a small town, I knew everybody in my graduating class. So, you know, to be not only put in a new setting where I don't know really a lot about what I'm going to be doing, but also with people I don't know and no one's like, they're all male. There's no one the same gender as me. You know, it's, it's hard, but it really helped me evolve a thicker skin and to realize that in real life, you're always going to be presented with those situations. There's no way to grow and you know learn more unless you throw yourself in head on and you just take it and you learn from it. And you know whether it goes good or bad, you know, you have to take what you did and evolve and change. So it really helped me do that a lot. Well, I appreciate the three of you coming in to talk with us today. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much.